Communication is essential in any relationship. Talking about your day, your hopes and dreams, fears and hangups. But in reality, communication can be challenging enough with the people that we're in closest contact with. So when it comes to God, how do you communicate with someone that you've never seen? But God says that when we speak, He hears us. He actually loves to hear about our day, our hopes and dreams, fears and hangups. The fact is, the God of the universe wants to be in communication with you. No appointment needed, no dress code required. He's listening. So Everyday Prayer, of course, is our theme. It's been these passages that we've been walking through, this theme that we're trying to understand. My assignment today is actually a prayer of great agony, of great anguish as well. Maybe you have prayed in such a time of anguish and agony. Maybe you got yourself into a real mess and really called out to God for help, or you or someone you care for maybe had a tragedy, and so you turned to God with urgent, just pleading prayer. Maybe you're uncertain about a decision and you begged out to God for help. Maybe you just see the brokenness and division in our world and you find yourself praying for something to change. Well, Jesus anguished prayer can be an example and a hope for us. That's what I just want to look at today. Jesus anguished prayer can be an example and a hope for us. My name is Ed Stetzer, teaching pastor here at High Point. I do want to welcome you at all of our campuses, for those of you in North Aurora, for those of you who are in Bolingbrook, Romeoville, for those in Naperville, Wheaton, and Monmouth as well, and those, of course, most of us now online. Uh, What an opportunity we have to learn about prayer. This series hopefully has been a blessing to you. Maybe as the writer of Hebrews says, it has provoked you to love and good deeds, because I believe this one will as well. We're going to look at some challenges, some real deep theology to walk through for just a minute as well. But Jesus' anguished prayer can be an example and a hope for us. Let's look at the passage. It's a bit of a lengthy passage, uh, so we'll touch on it, and then I'll go through it. But it's Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse 36 and going to verse 46, verse 36 through 46. It says this, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And Taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Goes on and says, and going a little farther, he fell on his face and praying, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now, I'm going to save the rest for the passage as we walk through it, but I want you to see that this is a agonizing moment of prayer. It's probably um, midnight as Jesus goes to Gethsemane to pray. Uh, the place is actually called Gethsemane, which we know is kind of a religious place, the Garden of Gethsemane. We, we know that language. But it's basically an area of olive presses, uh, quite, probably a quieter area. So Jesus prayed for the disciples uh, in John 17. And now here he prays for himself And his anguished prayer can be an example and a hope for us. Let's take a look at number one, kind of the context of the garden prayer, right? So again, then Jesus went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. So you have to have a mental picture that Jesus is actually saying, I'm going to go over there. You stay here and pray. It says in taking with him, he takes his core disciples with him, right? Taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. So just three people. This is like the core of the disciples who themselves are a core. He began to be sorrowful and troubled, which the word troubled is uh, doesn't really fully express what's going on here. We'll get to that more in a minute. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here. He asked them actually just to pray with him, right? I'm going to go over here and pray. Would you stay here? and pray. He says, remain here and watch with me. Watch is an idea that he would watch in prayer, right? Watch nights or these kind of traditional churches have watch nights of prayer. It says, and giving a little, going a little farther, he fell onto his face. So he's away from the disciples now saying, now I don't want you to miss this. This is one of the most important theological passages in the whole Bible. Um, It's my father, he's praying to his father. If it is possible let this cup pass from me. Now, the cup here is a cup of suffering. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, nevertheless, not as I will, but as uh, you will. So the reality of the cross 
is really bearing down on the Lord. He takes his concerns to the Father. Again, the place is called Gethsemane, which is a for us a religious word, but it's a, this olive press. It's it's an affluent probably place where where businessmen might have businessmen might have places. So Jesus takes his core disciples with them. He wants them to watch and pray. He's sorrowful, overwhelmed. Again, troubled is not strong enough of a word. It's more like terrible misery if we read the literal Greek. And this is a really bad time. And this is Jesus. I think it's important for you to see this is a really bad time. And Jesus is having a hard time in the midst of it. We sometimes want to see Jesus as never wrestling. Jesus is wrestling Jesus is being tested, tempted here. Jesus knows he's going to die, but even more than that, he's going to take the sins of the world and experience that agony. N.T. Wright puts it this way. He had looked into the darkness and seen the grinning faces of all the demons in the world looking back at him, and he begged and begged his father not to bring him to the point of going through it. This is so significant that Luke, who's the doctor, right? Dr. Luke writes the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Uh, he, Luke gives us more details. It says this, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. This is actually a physical condition that people do experience. They actually sweat blood in midst of a great mental anguish and turmoil. So that's what Jesus is experiencing, right? He is at this point asking God, he, no, don't miss this too, because he goes in and he, he asks his friends to pray for him. We're going to find out in just a minute that they went to sleep. So he has this desire with his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, uh, to kind of accompany him in the midst of this very painful time. And, 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 and yet they go to sleep. And then he sees before him this demand of the cross, right? He's going to face the reality. He's not just going to die on the cross. He's going to die on the cross for our sins and in our place by becoming our sin. All the sin that you and I committed is placed on Jesus. He, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us. So, so the anguish and the agony of that reality, the, 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 the wrath of God that was actually due to you and me for our sin is actually going to be placed on Jesus. And um, when really the son, I mean, the son had done nothing to offend the father. And so Jesus is at this point praying and saying, Lord, if this cup of suffering, a cup of suffering, we still think of it that way. That's sometimes the cup of suffering that I might have to drink of. Um, and so this cup, he says, let this cup pass from me. Now, now don't miss this. This is, in a sense, the battle that's going on. The first request of Jesus to the Father is to take away the cup. Uh, this was the real battle. Jesus then said, yet uh, as you will, which leads us to number two. If that's the context of the prayer, let's look at the challenge of the prayer. What's going on? Remember, Jesus' anguished prayer can be an example and a hope for us. So what's going on here is laid out more in the next few verses. It says in verse 40, and he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. Remember, he's already been abandoned. He's already seen his friends disappoint him. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me for one hour? In other words, I'm just going to pray for a little while. Can't you just pray for me a little while? And I guess they were tired. They were, the flesh was, was weary and so Jesus says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So Jesus longed for his disciples to be with him, but the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh was weak. He longed for his disciples to be there, but the end result is that um, they let him down. They were not there with him. And I would say it's hard to see this because we think of the disciples as great great people of faith, and they, and they, and they are. But here's the reality. Uh, we, we ourselves find a challenge to make a priority of prayer. The disciples could not stay awake when Jesus needed their prayer. But let's be honest, it's a challenge for all of us to make prayer a priority. Uh, you know, some of us are more contemplative, you know, thought-filled, you know, just love to sit and think and pray. Some of us are not. I'm in the not category. 
But we all need to engage in prayer in good times and in bad. And yet the challenge we see is that um, some of us are not naturally inclined towards that. Some of us are more activists by nature. So Donna, my wife, and I are uh, the opposites, right? So um, I'm an Enneagram 8, uh, which is um, kind of hard charging. Let's always do things and, and more. And she's an Enneagram 9, which um, is basically the godly version of those. Okay, it's not really the case, but she was well, in her case, it is. But um, so for her, she naturally can lean into that place of prayer and contemplation, where for me, I have to pry myself away from things to actually be able to do that. And that's what Jesus did. Uh, and I can learn from Jesus here. Right? Think about, these aren't on your screen, but think about Mark 135, very early in the morning. While it was still dark, Jesus got up, went to a solitary place where he prayed. Or Luke 516, it says, but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. So here's Jesus in a lonely place by himself, disciples not praying with him. Then he steps aside to pray, asks his disciples, they're asleep. Um, and here he is wrestling um, in the midst of this. Now, for all of us, there's a call and a place and an importance of us responding and prioritizing prayer. This is one of the things that we can learn. Remember, Jesus' anguished prayer can be an example and a hope for us. Jesus didn't just go to the Father at this moment. His life, someone once said that his life was going from a place of prayer to a place of prayer and in between doing miracles and teaching. Jesus was clearly uh, a prayer, and so can we be. But we have to recognize that even here, the challenge of prayer is to prioritize that prayer. The disciples are an example of those who did not. I mean, Jesus says, could you not just stay up and pray with me for one hour? When I was younger, uh, one of the things that, that, that I was really challenged by is ultimately the idea that I could walk through and uh, take a moment to take an hour a day to pray. Could you not tarry one hour? I think that was the name of the book and walk through and look through that and, and really wanted to live the kind of life where I prayed one hour a day. And in doing so, the end result was is that it built my prayer pattern. You see, I don't want you to miss that because the challenge of prayer is to create a pattern of prayer in our own lives so that in that moment of agony, we can, well, in the case of the disciples, not fall asleep, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak, but look to the example of Jesus as well. So he's isolated now. His anguished prayer can be an example and a hope for us. And I want us not to miss this because as we kind of walk through the rest of the passage, it's a reminder to us of that we're called to be people of prayer in times of anguish, agony, and times of joy and happiness and ease. Let's look at this. It's Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 says, Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Now, if you recognize that passage, you know what comes right after that is the peace of God, which passes all understanding, uh, really comes and guards your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. But what I want you to see God, we got the context. Now we got the challenge. The challenge is, can we, it's a challenge to me, can I be more of a person of prayer? Can I see Jesus' anguish prayer as an example and a hope for us? Because in doing so, we get a greater picture of what prayer is. And in just a moment, we're going to actually look at some of the theology that's so important to understand what undergirds, why is Jesus even praying about this if he believes it's God's will and in doing so, help us understand how we might take the challenge of being those kinds of prayerful people. Okay, so let's go to number three, because this is the commitment of prayer. And I'm not talking about the commitment to pray, but we're going to look at some of why Jesus did pray. Remember, his Jesus' anguish prayer can be an example and a hope for us as we're looking at this everyday prayer series. So this is what it says. It says, again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father. If this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Now, remember, this is the second time that he said something about, um, you know, Lord, I'm going to trust your will. Nevertheless, not as I will, this is verse 39, but as you will. And here he says, your will be done. 
Now, there's a lot of very important things going on here because the obvious question is, why is Jesus, who at this point knows, because in just a moment he talks about your betrayer and he's about to go into um, the last few days of his life, he knows that God has sent him to die on the cross for the sins of the world. So why is he, um, why is he asking to get out of that? And this is one of the great questions about um, how was Jesus tested um, or tempted, right? So, because we know the Bible talks about Jesus being uh, tempted, but what was he tempted to do? Well, we actually have an answer right here because Jesus was committed to ask the Lord and to trust the Lord. Now, I want you to miss this though, right? But he was struggling here to submit to the will of the Father, knowing the pain that was ahead. He was committed to ask the Lord and to trust the Lord. His response was consistent, as you will. His surrender to the Father's will was absolute. May we follow his example, right? But the cup Jesus was to drink was the cross, right? Represent the cross. And, and thank God that he drank that cup, turned it over and cried, it is finished on the cross. But we can't forget the agony and his willingness to submit to the Lord's will. As a matter of fact, this sounds like when he says, your will be done, it sounds just like what Jesus said earlier in the book of Matthew, in Matthew 6.10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But again, don't miss this. There's something fascinating going on here. Jesus is facing temptation. And this is not the first time. Now, what does that mean, right? What does it mean? Well, sometimes the word is words translated tested. In the ESV, it's translated temptation. Uh, this is the second cup of Jesus, the second request of Jesus. Remember, the, the first was, the first request was that he would uh, take away the cup. Now he comes back and we've got the second request, right? To, uh, is not to take cup away, but if this cannot pass without my drinking it, in other words, first, if possible, remove it. Second, give me strength to fulfill my mission. But again, something fascinating going on here. And we actually see it uh, reflected earlier in Matthew chapter 4. I don't want you to miss this, what's going on here. Because this is a, a theology that maybe we don't talk about as a lot. And we don't have time to fully unpack all of this. Um, you can read, there's lots of helpful articles um, on this as well. But in, in Matthew chapter 4... If you look at your Bible, it probably says, top of mind, top of mind um, it actually says the temptation of Jesus. So what was Jesus tempted? Was Jesus tempted? Well, it actually says this in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So how was Jesus tempted? And sometimes people might think, well, there's thousands of different ways. Well, we actually have biblical record of the temptation here. Let me share some of it here. It says, after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. This isn't on your screen, but it's Matthew chapter four, verse two and following. And Satan comes to him and says, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And he quotes the Bible back to him. So he was hungry. He was tempted to turn stones into bread and thus to perhaps end his fast prematurely. Or another way to show people, some people look at Matthew 4 and say one of his temptations was just to create food for all the people who would then follow him. He was tempted to skip the cross and maybe show by his power something else. In verse 5, it says, uh, then the devil took him up to a holy city, set him in a pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written that he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. So his temptation here is he could go up to the top of the temple, step off the temple, and imagine everyone watching Jesus descend, angels carrying him down. What a, what a wonderful path that might be compared to being lifted up on a cross, descending from the top of the temple carried by angels. So he, again, was, he was tempted to eat at first. He's tempted to skip the cross. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, again, not on your screen, I'm just reading through the text. It says, the devil took him to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory and said, I'll give these all to you if you fall down and worship me. So he was tempted to take a shortcut to his, through his suffering. So there's these testings, these temptations, and all of them have to do 
with Jesus not following the will of God in his life, which is a will that is a hard reality. It's a cross to bear. It's a cup of suffering to drink. And in the midst of all this, lest we forgot, it says this in Matthew chapter 26, verse 43. It says, and he came again and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went out and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. I want you to miss this. Three times in different ways, Jesus asked his father to not have him go through the suffering that was ultimately God's plan for his life. Now, Jesus was without sin. So even asking that question is not sinful. And I would tell you that there are times and places when we might know God's will and we say, Lord, could we, could we have another plan? Lord, if this is plan A, how about plan B? And it's not sinful to ask. It's not sinful to be tempted, not sinful to be tested. But Jesus was praying and submitting. He was, we can tell, struggling. Jesus was struggling in the midst of this moment. Now, my encouragement to you is to make prayer your priority. Ask God boldly. Right? That's, that's what's going on here, right? Jesus is bringing the prayer by the way, remember the temptation in Matthew 4 was these, these angels would sort of minister and come down to him. And I think it's interesting that in the midst of his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, the disciples not engaging in prayer, moving on, that um, Jesus, who earlier the temptation was, let's just step off the temple, not the cross, step off the temple and float down with angels carrying you into the crowds. That it was actually in Luke 22, verse 43, that it says, and there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. So even in the midst of the most difficult times of the crucifixion, that, that temptation that Satan laid before him was actually fulfilled in a right and godly way as Jesus pressed in to prayer. So Jesus pressed into prayer, and so can we. How, why, why does this matter? Make prayer your priority. Ask God boldly. Jesus asked God three times, and each time said, Lord, but whatever your will is. I mean, the third time we don't hear his words exactly, but the third time it says he said the same thing. So he's saying, Lord, if this cup can pass from me, if somehow I can do this without taking this. And yet he kept saying, thy will be done, your will above mine. The submission's obvious, but it's make prayer your priority. Ask God boldly, trust God completely. They're all part of what this leads us to, which leads to number four and finally, which may seem like an odd ending to the passage. I mean, I didn't have to include it, right? I, I didn't have to say we go this far. But I want you to remember that Jesus' anguished prayer can be an example and a hope for us. And here, his agony and his submission bring some godly resolution to the whole situation. Look with me at Matthew 26, verses, uh, back to 26, verses uh, 45 and 46. It says, sleep and take your rest. He says to his disciples, he said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand and the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. There's actually a piece of art I debated whether to include or not. It actually encompasses all this whole scene and you can actually see the, the people coming from the distance to come get Jesus. So his betrayers, he says, rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So this piece of art from the 15th century sort of betrays the disciples sleeping, Jesus over here, and the crowd, people already coming that direction because Jesus already knew. So he says, see, my betrayer is at hand. And spoiler alert, you can actually look ahead and we find Judas and we find them taking him and more. Um, so, so again, but we don't have time to unpack all of that. Just as we didn't unpack fully our understanding, seeing Jesus being tested and tempted, here we can't under, unpack fully the betrayal that comes because our focus here is prayer and everyday prayer. It's been the focus of our series. And my hope is that wherever you are listening, your family, individually, um, whatever might be your journey, that this series has helped you grow, challenge me, help you grow more as a person of prayer. Because remember, Jesus' anguished prayer here can be an example and a hope for us. Maybe you've seen this. So, now, so here Jesus says, comes back to the disciples who are sleeping, wakes them up, says, sleep, take your rest later on. The hour's at hand, maybe points over to the distance. The son of man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. There's Judas um, and the betrayers and the group to arrest him. Rise, let us be going. My betrayer is at hand. Now it's kind of interesting, the language here, right? Um, just not miss this, right? 
Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. I don't want to overread into the text, but it sounds to me somebody has come to a piece of God's will. Somebody has aligned rightfully under the will of God. I don't know if you've noticed that. I've, I've noticed that in a lot of cases um, where somebody wrestles with a call to global missions. Maybe that's you and, you know, we'd love to talk with you about that. Our minister of missions, Robert Johnson and others, we'd love to talk about they wrestle and they're, they're unhappy often and they're not sure. And then they finally get to the place that, you know, God's called me to, to, to engage in cross-cultural missions. There's like a peace and they're like, okay, now something like, you know, let's be going. I, I need to get trained. I'm going to go overseas as a missionary. Maybe you've seen that in the case of a situation where it couldn't be resolved and finally just came to peace that the Lord's at work in this. And I, I've seen it more than once in a tragic situation where somebody came to a peace, the fact that they weren't going to survive this. And there's just a sense of, okay, I can face this now. I can trust the Lord in the midst of this terminal illness or more. No one should miss this, right? Because maybe you've seen somebody, prayer brought the resolve to meet the challenge. Just as here, prayer brought the resolve to meet the challenge of the cross and the humiliation Jesus would face for a sinful world. Jesus came to that peace in prayer. That's what seems to have happened with Jesus here. And so it can be with us to wrestle, to struggle in prayer is what Jesus did and to what we can do as well. So the question for us today is, is how might Jesus' anguished prayer be our example and a hope for us? First of all, Jesus was not a uh, seldom or unusual prayer and neither should we be. Um, he had a pattern of prayer. He had a practice of prayer. It's, it's convicting to me, I encourage it to be convicting to you. Uh, but also in the midst of prayer, Jesus was wrestling and struggling. I, I think it's okay to use those words, right? The word temptation might even cause some of us to struggle. What does that mean? And, um, but Jesus was being um, uh, struggling with the idea. And we saw in Matthew 4, the temptation to shortcut around the cross. And here it is in this prayer. And in this moment, Jesus says, not my will but yours be done. And here's ultimately what prayer does for us. Many things. But prayer, in prayer, we often align our heart once again with God's. So much of what I pray for, um, can I, I just be honest with you? Uh, there's a lot of things I pray for that don't happen the way I pray for them. Jesus, this didn't happen the way Jesus prayed. But when I pray, my heart gets realigned so that in the midst of it, I can trust him for the answer. And I can pray, not, not my will, but your will be done. Now, this is a recurring theme. Uh, there's something powerful here about coming to clarity of purpose after a time of agony in prayer. Again, Jesus' anguished prayer can be an example and a hope for us. And when we look at this, to me, it reminds me of a beautiful passage that I often come back to in the Old Testament. And it goes like this. And maybe this is even what came to Jesus' mind. I don't know. It says, trust in the Lord, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. So right now, Jesus is saying, let this cup pass from me. But he's not to lean on his understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. That's what Jesus does. Not once, but twice, your will, not mine. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will make straight your paths. Here's the reality. Prayer often realigns us under the will of God, submitting to the plan of God in our lives. Jesus' anguish prayer can be both an example and a hope to us when we understand, well, a few things. So let me close with this. Because if you're not a follower of Jesus, you need to understand that all that anguish was actually for you. Jesus' death on the cross for our sin and in our place was for you. And maybe someone from High Point reached out, invited you, you're watching online. Can I say to you that I want you to see that the Savior of the world submitted to his Father, received the punishment and penalty of all of your sins in himself so that you might receive by grace and through faith new and eternal life. You can ask for forgiveness of sins and be granted forgiveness of sins. You can receive new life and experience and live out that new life. And I invite you today to walk and respond to that. This moment that you're seeing right here is what Jesus is going through and agonizing for you. 
And if you don't know the Lord, I invite you to trust and follow him today. Matter of fact, you can actually indicate that right in our online portal, wherever you might be, you can indicate that. And we'll actually pray with you, respond with you, and share with you. And if you're a follower of Jesus, what a reminder this is to make prayer your priority, ask God boldly, and then still trust God completely. Because his anguished prayer can be an example and a hope for us. I'll do this whole series. I'm convicted, hope you are as well, that we can, should, and must lean into prayer, maybe even more so during these difficult and challenging times. A study came out about a week and a half ago that actually said that Christians are reading the Bible and praying less during COVID. This is a tough time. May Jesus' anguished prayer be an example and a model for us, a hope for us, that we might lean in. We might be able to watch and pray and say, Lord Jesus, give us your grace and strength. We align ourselves under your will. We make prayer your priority. Ask God boldly and trust God completely. Would you pray with me? Father, we acknowledge that by grace and through faith, you have given us new life, access to the Father through prayer. And we come before you today in prayer, trusting you. Father, I pray that in my own life, you'd help me grow in this area as a prayer. And for others, Lord, you would help us to grow in our prayer patterns so that we might look like Jesus as a prayer. And then those moments of struggle and fear and maybe uncertainty, we might align ourselves under your will, not your will, but ours. Help us make prayer a priority. Ask God boldly and trust God completely in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.